And welcome everyone to Sports Talk Line, where we talk sports 24-7, 365. And on today's episode of Battle for the Big East, we got Aiden Curran from Hilltop Hoops. And we're going to be talking about the IT program right now in college basketball. And it's not 1985, it's 2021 in the Georgetown Hoyas. Aiden, how are you doing today? Tom, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, happy to be here. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's been a great time, great week uh, to be a Georgetown Hoya. And uh, we'll see what happens now. It's time to go dancing. Yeah, I, I definitely think too, you know, it's amazing how the fortunes of a program can change in a week in March. And, you know, Georgetown, I think they did benefit a little bit from from the bracket they were in. They, they faced Villanova without Colin Gillespie, um, but still they, they went 23 from 23 and they ran the table in the Big East tournament. So the first question I think we need to talk about is, you know, how did Patrick Ewing turn around the program this season? Because the Hoyas were three and eight going into a COVID pause. And after that COVID pause, they became 10 and four. How did this turnaround happen? Yeah, you know, it, it really had everything to do with that that three week COVID pause in the middle of the season. Uh, you know, they they go on the road and play at Syracuse. I think they were three and nine at that point, and uh, thing, things weren't looking good after they lost to uh, their their arch rivals um, up in upstate New York. And so at that point, you know, they were a lot closer to 11th place than they were first place in the Big East. And so coming into the season, Georgetown fans, we were just hoping to avoid the basement. You know, as, as long as we didn't finish in 11th place, um, that was going to be a success for us. We knew that this program had to basically restart its rebuild after Patrick Ewing had the, the mass exodus of transfers last season. Uh, and then, so whatever happened in that COVID pause just really turned everything around for this team. I think one of the, the key factors that Patrick Ewing uh, points to was the insertion of uh, graduate transfer Chudy Air Belay into the starting lineup. Uh, this is his first year at Georgetown and he started off the season kind of like Georgetown. He started off not great. Um, he was struggling shooting. Uh, he was turning the ball over at, at a high rate. Uh, it just wasn't really working out with him in Georgetown. And, uh, you know, maybe it was just confidence of being put into the starting lineup, but he really has galvanized the team with his effort. Uh, his his three-point shot has started to fall. Um, and he's really been kind of one of the main anchors of the Georgetown defense, which has been, I would say, the biggest key to this turnaround for Georgetown. I mean, they went from... I mean, defense has been the, the biggest Achilles heel for Patrick Ewing and his teams in these four years. And for whatever reason, it's it's almost completely turned around. I mean, they are one of the best defensive teams in the country right now, and uh, you know it's just it's just incredible what's what's happened. So I would say the um, you know the growth of Chudier Belay has led to improvement in the defense, and uh, Dante Harris, uh, the freshman point guard, he's really stepped up as well. So it's really just come all together at the same time, and and here we are on an incredible run. Yeah, that's true. And, and now when you looked at the roster, you know, some surprises, you know, Javon Blair and Jamaro Pickett, you know, you kind of would expect for them to have big seasons and, and kind of lead the way, especially after the mass exodus that occurred with Georgetown. But let me ask you this. You might have hit on it a little bit before, but which players stepped up enough to allow Georgetown to go on this run, even before the run in the Big East tournament? Because they did have some perf- uh, impressive wins. They won at Creighton after the pause, and, and it looked like they were a tough team to play against uh, in fe- end of February and early March. Yeah, so coming into the season, it was going to be Jamarco Pickett and um, Javon Blair, who, who were the, the keys to the team. This team was always going to go as far as they could carry them. Um, we weren't really sure what we were going to get out of Dante Harris. We weren't sure what we were going to get out of Trudy or Belay. Um, so it was really going to be up to Blair and Pickett. And, you know, both those players have, have had their ups and downs in uh, in Georgetown uniforms, uh, especially Pickett. You know, he he came in, uh, he's from Washington, D.C., and with his long arms and his height, he drew immediate comparisons to Kevin Durant, which were unfair. Uh, and they still are unfair, but hopes were high for him. And, you know, he, he can score the ball, but he doesn't always, it, it takes some time for him to get locked in and focused. And so um, this season, you know, he, he's had those up and down performances, but, um, you know, whether it be Pickett or Blair, when one of those guys gets going, this team can really um, compete with the best. And if both of them are playing well at the same time, which is what happened in the Big East tournament, then you're seeing a Georgetown team that can compete with anyone. Patrick Ewing has said that all season long, that he, he believes with the exception of the 
um, road game against Seton Hall where they they got blown out. Um, they've played with every team. They, they were right there with West Virginia. Um, and so Pickett and Blair, right now, everything's going well. Pickett is uh, defending at a really high level. He shut down uh, Sandra Mamakalashvili in the Big East semifinal. Uh, and, and Blair uh, has actually been moved to the bench. He was uh, he was benched for a whole game by Ewing at the end of the season. He's been on the bench ever since, but he's accepted the demotion. And he's still he's still closing out games, and he's providing a major scoring punch for this Georgetown team. So you have one senior leader who is a do it all, um, you know, three and D kind of defender, and then you have Blair who can just light it up uh, at any given moment. So those two have been the keys for Georgetown. And you know, as you can see from the Big East tournament, as they go. Georgetown goes, um, and I, I have to give some recognition to Dante Harris. Uh, he, he wasn't expected to be a starter this season. Uh, Jalen Harris was a transfer from Arkansas. Um, he was expected to be the guy, and, and Dante Harris. Dante Harris was the 415th ranked prospect in high school last year. So there were there were minimal expectations for him. You know, if he was going to be your backup point guard, that would be a success. Um, Jalen Harris had to take a leave of absence and hasn't returned to the team since. Um, and Dante Harris took the starting role and ran with it. Um, you know, he had his ups and downs. He has growing pains in the, during the season, but um, it's really the mentality that sticks out with him. He, he's, a, he's a fearless kid. He loves to do the little things. He, he defends, he rebounds, uh, and he's going he's to be a focal point of this matchup against Colorado. Um, they have McKinley Wright at point guard, and Dante is going to have to do his best to stay with him. And if Dante can limit Wright, I like the Hoyas' chances. You know, I, I'm glad you mentioned Colorado because a week ago, no one would have believed Georgetown would have made the NCAA tournament. Very, very few people probably honestly believed that they could win um, the whole tournament, but they did. And now they were given a 12th seed and they match up against Colorado. How do you think Georgetown will match up with Colorado um, in the NCAA tournament? In, in that pivotal 5-12 game, a lot of upsets. There's a lot of 12 seeds that get that knock out the five seed and then can make a run and also if georgetown does knock out colorado they got a potential date with florida state which was the dominant team in the acc even though the acc hasn't been as strong so how do you like those two chances of first going up against colorado and if georgetown gets past colorado how they would match up with florida state or the other team that they can run into yeah, so I think the Colorado matchup is it's a favorable one for Georgetown. I think out of all the 12-5 matchups, um, you know, them against Buffalo is is a pretty decent matchup. Um, I think that it, it would have been really fun. Uh, there, there were a lot of Georgetown fans that were hoping that uh, we would draw Texas Tech in the 12-5 matchup because former Hoya and Mac McClung is now on the Red Raiders, and, and there's some uh, there's some bitter feelings left over in the Georgetown fan base from his departure. But uh, yeah, you know, Colorado, they you know they were. Um, they lost to Oregon State in the Pac-12 championship, um, a solid team. They, they've beaten USC, who I think is probably the, the best uh, Pac-12 team uh, three times this season. So obviously a good team. They are uh, led by McKinley Wright. Um, you know, I, I, like, I like this team's chances right now. If Georgetown can, can bring its defense and its rebounding to Indianapolis from New York City, I think they're going to be a tough out in the NCAA tournament. I think it's it's pretty surprising because they're one of the trendiest uh, upset picks in the tournament right now, um, especially according to the betting market. And that's a, that's kind of a reversal of fortunes because Georgetown in the past with uh, its NCAA tournament appearance, uh, it's been the team that's been getting upset. Um, so now we're kind of in that Cinderella uh, role that we've been going up against in past tournaments. Um, so I, I think it's a good matchup. I think that you know, again, if Pickett and Blair can show up and, and if Pickett especially um, can bring that same defense, that same three-point shooting, um, I think it's really going to come down to that harris right matchup at point guard. Um, Dante Harris was the most outstanding player of the Big East tournament. He's really arrived on the, the big stage and he's really staking his claim to be one of the best players in the Big East. And now he gets to go up against McKinley Wright, who's probably a, a top 10, top 15 guard in this country. Uh, I think it's going to be another chance for Dante to prove himself against, you know, one of the the alpha dogs of uh, the NCAA, you know, Division One game this year. Um, and I think that if um, Paris can slow down right, I think I, I really like the Hoy's chances here. Um, I just think everything is clicking right now and the way that they control the paint, I think that's going to be a major factor in this game. And then going, uh, 
then if we want to look ahead, um, you have Florida State after that, most likely unless Wes Miller's UNC Greensboro team can trip them up. You know, I think that's going to be an interesting matchup. Um, I haven't seen too much of them this year, but I know they're a long and athletic team. Um, length has given Georgetown some issues this season, so I think that would be a tough matchup. Uh, I think, you know, Florida State would rightfully be favored. Um, but, you know, I mean, Florida State led by Scotty Barnes. Georgetown has a, a player who can stick with Barnes. You know, Barnes is tall and athletic. He's He's got that length. But we have Jamarco Pickett, who, who is a wing, kind of that point forward stopper. Uh, I think he would match up really well with Barnes, and, and that could disrupt the Seminoles. So, you know, I, I think obviously being a 12 seed, you're going to have a tough draw in the first round and after that. So obviously this, whether it be Florida State or anyone else in that region, it was going to be a tough second round game. But, you know, things are rolling for Georgetown. And, you know, I, I, I wouldn't have expected them to win the Big East tournament, but here they are. So who's to say they can't make some noise against Florida State and, uh, you know, possibly head to a Sweet 16 matchup against Michigan, which would be a, a very fun matchup between Juwan Howard and Patrick Ewing. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And Aiden, you're talking about upsets before, and hopefully people don't get upset here. So they hit that like and subscribe button so they can Absolutely. follow with Sports Talk Line on YouTube to get all these episodes about for the Bees. Now, you mentioned the name Mac McClung, and I saw that there was one bracket that had Texas Tech 5, Georgetown 12. And, and I think Mac McClung, I believe if he played at Duke, would be the most hated player in NCAA college basketball. Um, but you, you kind of bring up, you know, a point since you kind of brought up Mac McClung, he kind of symbolized like, okay, I'm leaving the program's going to rebuild. How do Hoya fans look at Mac McClung and oh boy, how would they have reacted if they got a matchup in the NCAA tournament against Mac McClung and took him out? Yeah. So that there's a lot of hard feelings, um, from Hoya's fans towards Mac, um, you know, when, when he left Georgetown, he made a, he made a comment interview about um, there being a, a lack of a family atmosphere at Georgetown and how that was one of the um, deciding factors in his decision to choose Texas Tech because he felt that family atmosphere. And, and really throughout the years, dating back to the Thompson era, you know, family has been one of the things that this program, this university has prided itself on. So that really, that really hit a, a sore spot with the Georgetown fan base. Now, a lot of Georgetown fans also like to criticize Mac for his his lack of defense, and he can be an inefficient scorer sometimes. He can jack up those shots, um, and that was definitely a weakness of his. You know, as a freshman and sophomore at Georgetown, the defense was inconsistent, and I mean, he's an incredible shot maker, but he he needed to pick his spots better. So, you know, between that, between his departure and his his somewhat frustrating game at times, you know, there it would be if if they had drawn Texas Tech in a 12-5 matchup and had defeated Texas Tech. I mean that. This fan base would be just overjoyed just to see Mac McClung be, be lose at the Hoyas hands. Now, from my perspective, you know, Mac McClung, he he put his heart out there for Georgetown. Uh, he played through injury. They rushed him back through injury. Uh, and there are some things there that, you know, Georgetown's a fall for. Um, they, they didn't really handle his health too well with his, his foot. He uh, tore his plantar fasciitis. Um, and, you know, Georgetown lacks scores this season. And I like to tell a lot of my followers who like to complain about Mac that, you know, what player Georgetown could have used at least earlier in the season before his magical run, it would have been Mac McClung. Um, you know, he's he's stepped it up and he's taken it to another level at Texas Tech. Um, he's become a better distributor. Uh, he's been, he has some of the best defensive numbers on uh, the Red Raiders squad. Um, so I, I think he's a great player. I think he's misunderstood from his time at Georgetown. And, uh, you know, I personally wish him the best of luck on uh, on his side of the bracket. Okay, now we, we kind of talked about, I guess, the not-so-distant future for Georgetown going into NCAA tournament. But, you know, Patrick Ewing, he made a lot of noise on the recruiting track. You know, and he kind of slowly built up. One big recruit he got out of Long Island was guard Jordan Riley. Uh, the next recruit he got, speaking of the family, uh, setup is he got Ryan Matumbo, six foot eleven center from Atlanta, who happens to be the son of the Hoya Destroyer Dikembe Matumbo. And then to top it off, he was able to go out and get five star recruit Amu Muhammad. So how do you think, you know, how is the feeling with Ewing, you know, because it felt like a lot of the positives was the recruiting class Ewing was bringing in. But now you have this on the court success with a lot of returning players being combined with this top top 10 recruiting class 
how, how do the Hoya fans feel about this and their chances going forward in the Big East and also to potentially be a national powerhouse? Yeah, so Tom, can I tell you something? I don't think uh, I don't think Georgetown's done in the class of 2021. Okay. Um, Patrick Baldwin Jr. is a top five player. Uh, he's still yet to commit. And Georgetown's been involved with him for a while. And uh, in the last couple of weeks, there's been for from a couple of people that uh, things are things are looking good for Georgetown with Baldwin. Uh, he's his dad is the coach at Milwaukee, um, and so it was expected in, in the couple months back he was uh, slated to go to Milwaukee. But uh, Georgetown's kind of emerged in the last couple of weeks, and if they were to get Baldwin Jr., that would give them the number two recruiting class in the class of 2021. Right now, I think they're at number 11. Um, so, I mean, they're, Patrick Ewing is doing a great job as it is, but there's still room for improvement here. Um, and I wouldn't count out the Hoyas yet with Baldwin. So, uh, you know, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, maybe right after the tournament, we'll hear his decision. But yeah, Patrick Ewing, really from the get-go, he, he's proven that he can recruit. And that was one of the major concerns about him coming in. You know, he's, when he was hired by Georgetown, I think he was 56, 57 years old. Um, and people weren't really sure if Ewing was going to have the chops to get out on the recruiting trail and really, you know, bring that talent back to Georgetown. That was one of the things that led to, um, you know, John Thompson III getting let go. Is he, he just, that DC pipeline fell apart and he just wasn't bringing in the same caliber of prospect. Um, and, and Ewing proved pretty quickly that he could recruit. He brought in Mac McClung. Mm -hmm. um, he brought in James Akinjo. Um, and now he's doing it again. You know, he had to kind of reset from last year, but now he's got a top 10 class and they still might not be done in that same top 10 class. Um, you know, I, I think that the biggest key for Patrick Ewing based on last year is keeping those players. He's proven that he can bring them in. Now you got to prove that you can keep them. So now I think that's that was a major learning lesson of his from last season, learning how, you know, it, it, Patrick Ewing runs a tight ship. It's his way or the highway. And in today's college game, you know, it, it's a player's league. It's a player's league in the pros and it's becoming a player's league in college. He found that out with Mac McClung. He found that out with James Akinjo, both just wanted to get out of there. So now he's got, he's kind of, he's trying to figure out how to kind of massage those egos. So you got Jordan Riley coming in from Long Island. He's the best player on Long Island. Um, he would have been a five-star player if there was an AAU season. I firmly believe that. Um, he's an, an incredibly athletic freak. Um, Aminu Mohammed, just a really a groundbreaking commitment. The first five star for Ewing. Um, just there, there are so many parallels really to Mohammed coming to Georgetown and Ewing coming to Georgetown. Both came in at a time when Georgetown was was starting to be on the increase, but they needed that that one star to get them over the hump. And there's there's a lot of expectations over Mohammed. Um, you know, he's a really great player. Um, you know, he's coming to Georgetown for the right reasons, and uh, you know they're. We'll see what happens next year. I mean, if it, even without, if they don't get Baldwin, um, there's going to be there's going to be expectations, um, really, for the first time um, under Patrick Ewing. You know, of getting to the NCAA tournament, and making some noise. So he did it this year, and the squad next year should be better. Um, so I, I think that Georgetown, um, even without that that top ten class, you know, they're back in the tournament this year. I think Georgetown is pretty close to being back is that Georgetown brand. You're seeing the defense, you're seeing the rebounding, you're seeing that that old school Hoya Paranoia type play. Um, and I think that's a result of, of Ewing's coaching really taking root with this team. So I think there's a lot of reason to feel uh, optimistic about the direction that uh, Georgetown is heading. Yeah, Aiden, you know, I, I totally agree. I think it's safe to say Georgetown won't be picked 11th in the Big East preseason poll next year. Um, Definitely. But speaking about going into the future, since realignment, Villanova has been the top of the league. They've won two national titles and it's, you know, Villanova has been dominating, you know, they, they've won seven out of eight regular season championships. They, they've won a handful of Big East tournaments. Do you think Georgetown is actually equipped going forward with the coaching and the talent to finally wrestle away that number one spot from Villanova and finally open the league up to other teams claiming that top spot, if not claiming for themselves in Georgetown. Absolutely, I mean that that's been the goal. I think that I think that Villanova is always going to be at or near the top. I, I think uh, I think the world of Jay Wright. I think he's an excellent coach, and I think he's built an excellent program. But I mean, you're starting to see it this year. You know, Georgetown wins the Big East. UConn was one of the hottest teams coming into um, March, and you know, we'll see what happens with them in the NCAA tournament. But you got that. 
that trio of Villanova, Georgetown, UConn, that, you know, ideally is, is annually competing for Big East title. And you got St. John's. Um, I mean, I think that they had a strong season under Mike Anderson. I think things were starting to come together there. Um, I've been a big fan of Posh Alexander heading back to his high school days. I was, I was banging the Posh Alexander drum heading into the season. So I felt a little vindicated that he won a Big East freshman of the year, but I think St. John's heading in the right direction and it would be fun to have them, you know, make the trio into a quartet. Um, you know, I think I, I was surprised. I, I, I bet, I bet on them uh, to win the big East. I bet on UConn and St. John's took them, um, took their tournament futures to win the big East tournament. So I was surprised that they lost to Seton Hall, but uh, you know, I think Posh Alexander being hurt might've limited them and whatever happened to Isaiah Moore. I think that that's going to be one thing to watch for you guys next season is what happened with them. Cause I, you know, I, I don't think he had a, a starring role for them this season, but he was a really athletic player and I think raised the ceiling of that team. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if they can, you know, make up for his uh, departure next season. But I think St. John's in the right direction. And, you know, yeah. if we can have those four teams competing year in and year out, I mean, you're really going to get those that old Big East vibe back. And I think that's a great thing for this conference. And yeah. I think Georgetown, you know, whether it be next year or the year after, it'll be uh, you know, right back at the top competing right there. Yeah, I definitely think, too, when you look at St. John's, you know, you mentioned Posh Alexander, and he was, you know, St. John's was recruiting Jordan Riley, and I believe Jordan Riley's father went, went, went on and said, listen, you know, my, my son really can't compete yet with Posh Alexander for playing time. That's kind of one of the deciding choices that pushed Jordan Riley um, to Georgetown. But, you know, I, when you look at the peak of the Big East, you always had that Georgetown-St. John's rivalry, and that's something with Mike Anderson uh, could happen. They, they supposedly have most of the players returning. Isaiah Moore is transferring, but usually when you look at him, he's great at finishing around the rim. Um, he, he did get suspended a game or two for um, certain off the court issues. And it's going to be interesting to see who, who they bring in. You know, uh, it looks like Mike Anderson is more of a developer than he is a recruiter. When you look at Dylan and Wusu, I think he surprised a lot of players. And I think he has a bright future. He's six foot four, 235 pounds. He can finish at the rim. He can knock down threes. And it's going to be interesting to see going forward. But I definitely think, you know, it will be great for the Big East if Georgetown and St. John's are having classic rivalry matchups um, going forward. And you throw UConn and Villanova in, it's almost like it's, you know, 1985 or 1999 all over again. But we'll see what happens. But before we leave, Aiden, can you tell everyone where we can find you on social media and on the Internet? Yeah, absolutely. So you, you can find me uh, at Aiden Curran underscore on Twitter. Um, also feel free to follow my website, Hilltop Hoops uh, on Twitter as well. That's uh, at Hilltop Hoops underscore. Uh, we also have the Bulldog Banter podcast. You can find that on whichever uh, you know podcast platform that you listen to. But uh, it, it was great joining you today, Tom. And uh, you know, looking forward to seeing where uh, the Big East uh, goes from here, because I think there's a lot of reason to be hopeful for really the future of this conference as a whole. So really exciting times. Yeah, no matter what Jay Billis says, the Big East isn't dead. All right. Exactly. Thanks for coming on, Aiden. And remember, everyone, to listen like you play with intensity.